Thanks, Luke, and thanks to all of the organizers of this conference uh, for putting together such a nice event and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so what I'm going to speak about is at least partially related to uh, the topics of Brett and Zhang Hui's talks. Um, so I apologize if there's any overlap or I'm going over things that people have seen before. Um, but what I'm really interested in in this talk is looking at weighted estimates for the Bergman and Zega projections on less smooth, uh, strongly pseudo-convex domains. Um, so to start with, uh, let's first begin just with uh, two problems, which I think many people in the audience are well familiar with, uh, related to, to the behavior of the Bergman and Zago projections, uh, which will just denote by calligraphic B and calligraphic S respectively. And so the first question is just for which domains uh, do these mappings extend to bounded uh, mappings on LP for all P between one and infinity? And as everybody knows, uh, the boundary geometry of the domain is really important uh, in determining the answer to this question. Um, so first we're gonna ask, for which domains do we have sort of this um, nice, we get the full reflexive range of P's for LP regularity. And then one could ask um, for such a domain, uh, for which weights uh, does B or S extend to a bounded operator on weighted LP? Uh, just like Brett and Shank we were talking about. And with respect to question one, um, it's been studied on many different types of domains. Uh, one class, important class, of course, is strongly pseudo-convex domains. It was sort of first studied with C infinity boundary um, by Thong and Stein, I believe. Um, but this property is actually known to hold in the minimal smooth in this case. So when D is strongly pseudo-convex, with C2 boundary, and this is due to Lenzani and Stein, um, these operators are actually bounded on the uh, full reflexive range of P. So our motivating question was really to try to um, obtain results uh, for these operators on domains with uh, near minimal smoothness. Uh, let me just take a brief detour into uh, weighted theory. Uh, Again, I apologize if people have uh, seen these things before, uh, but in harmonic analysis, we're interested in determining the boundedness properties of integral operators on unweighted spaces. Um, so the, one of the original questions was determining the behavior of the Hilbert transform on weighted spaces, and that led to the Muck and Taub A2 condition. And so a uh, weight for us, we're back in the scalar value case now, so it's just gonna be a locally integrable function that is positive almost everywhere. And we can define the Muck and Haub AP class, um, which has been defined before in previous talks, so I won't belabor it. Um, I'll just mention that you can either take a supremum over balls or cubes, uh, and they will give you equivalent uh, quantities. Um, and basically what you're doing is you're taking an average of the weight on the ball or cube times the average of um, some power of it's reciprocal. When P equals two, it's just the average of the reciprocal. And I'm requiring that to be finite as I take a supremum over all, all cubes or all balls. And uh, heuristically, what this condition is saying is that the weight um, behaves on all scales uh, kind of like a constant, uh, like a constant function with respect to this integral condition. Uh, because of course, if you just take your weight to be a constant, then you'll get the constant here, reciprocal of the constant, and they will cancel out. And why are these weights important in harmonic analysis? Well, they are precisely the weights for which the Hardy-Littlewood uh, maximal function is bounded on uh, weighted LP. And um, it's well known that the, the maximal function is, is bounded on LP. Uh, that's usually proven by um, the proving a weak type estimate. Um, and then uh, you have the L infinity estimate immediately, and then you do an in, in, interpolation. Uh, but then you could ask for which weights is the hardy littlewood maximal function bounded, and it turns out to be exactly for the AP weights. And this is also connected to Calder and Zygmunt 
singular interval operators. So it turns out that Calderon Zygmunt singular interval operators are bounded on a uh, weighted LP if the weight belongs to AP. Uh, so in general, you don't get both directions. You don't get uh, the necessity of the AP condition. Uh, but for specific operators, such as the Hilbert transform or the Reese transforms, you do get the um, necessity of the AP condition. Now let me talk about um, just briefly define space as a homogeneous type. Um, so I introduced these quantities in the Euclidean setting, but the idea is that you can look at them in a much more uh, general form. And um, so the definition of a space of homogeneous type is that I have a measure space X mu, and I suppose I have some uh, distance-like function from X cross X to the reals that satisfies the following. Um, it's positive and it equals zero if and only if X equals Y, uh, not negative, excuse me. Um, it's symmetric. And the third condition is that it satisfies this quasi-triangle inequality. So if C equals one, then it's just an ordinary triangle inequality. If C is greater than one, uh, it's a quasi-triangle inequality. So this is basically all the properties of the metric, of a metric, except the triangle inequality is replaced by this quasi-triangle inequality. So then we would call the function B um, a quasi-metric or a pseudo-metric. Um, and the last condition we assume is that the, the doubling property of our measure. So we suppose that there exists some constant C um, so that for all balls defined in this way in quasi-metric, so uh, the ball centered at X radius R is defined to be the set of Y in X so that the, the distance or quasi-distance from X to Y is less than R. And I require this doubling condition um, on the measure. And that's that uh, the measure of a ball centered at X radius 2R is controlled uh, by at most a, a constant. Uh, times the measure of the ball centered at X of radius R. And if all those conditions are satisfied, then the triple X D mu is called a space, a homogeneous type. And let me just say that you can also formulate the definition of AP on a uh, space of homogeneous type. You just replace uh, your cubes or balls with uh, the balls in your quasi metric um, so that the balls that reflect the appropriate geometry. And you would replace the big measure by whatever your, your, your measure is. And so um, these concepts can be generalized and the same singular integral theory uh, goes through. And that's kind of the point of uh, space homogeneous type is to generalize these concepts in harmonic analysis above the Euclidean type. Um, and so to answer the second problem, which is uh, related to for what weights does uh, the Bergman projection extend to a bounded operator. Uh, that was um, answered in 1981 uh, by Becolet, um, which was elabor an elaboration of some previous work of Bonami. Me. Um, and they completely characterized the weights for which the Bergman projection is bounded on weighted LP. And since this has been defined before in the previous two talks, I'm not gonna belabor it. Um, but basically, you have this muckahab like quantity. You, I'm taking a supremum over Carlos and Pence, um, which were defined in Zhang Hui's talk. You can also uh, think of it this way uh, by introducing this quasi distance D on the ball and uh, taking a supremum only over those balls that meet the boundary. Uh, so that's where this condition R greater than one minus mod Z. 1 minus mod z is going to be the distance to the boundary. So I'm, I'm taking the supremum over a more limited uh, collection of balls that actually see the boundary. And so that's the definition of the Beckley bonomy class. Um, and the main theorem is that the Berman projection on the unit ball is bounded on weighted, uh, weighted LP if and only if the weight belongs to uh, the class. And as uh, Brett mentioned earlier, um, the, the key idea in the proof is to view the Bergman projection as a singular integral operator um, with respect to the quasi-metric that we introduced on the previous slide. And then you can apply ideas from Calder and Zygmunt theory, in particular, proving a good lambda inequality. And 
it's also kind of immediate. Um, I'll just mention that um, there was a question before about what's the right possible ways for studying uh, the boundary, which would be the Zago projection. And uh, in just to mention one, so if I'm thinking about the Zago projection on the circle, it's immediate from singular integral theory that the Zago projection is bounded on weighted LP of the circle, uh, if and only if the weight belongs to AP of the circle. So that's the, the ordinary AP class where I just take a supremum over intervals on the circle. And the reason for that is that the behavior of the, the, the Zago projection or the Reese projection as it's, some, it's sometimes called in one dimension is the same as the behavior of the Hilbert transform on the circle. So that's sort of immediate. And so we have this uh, one class of weights, which is good for the Bergman projection, and one class of weights, which is good for the Zago projection. And of course, a natural question, and uh, the previous two talks have addressed this in some ways, is if this technique can be applied to domains other than the ball. And um, now I'm going to talk about kind of what's unique to this talk. So uh, the novelty here is that we're looking at domains which are, 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 are less smooth. And, and the problem is that uh, strong estimates in, on the Bergman and Zago kernels aren't available in this setting. Um, so we're going to use some ide ideas that go back to Kurzman and Stein that were used by Lenzani and Stein in proving LP regularity. And so the general idea is that you can construct an auxiliary operator, which I'm going to call P or C in the case of the Zago projection. Uh, using some theory and several complex variables. And the key is that this operator is going to be a non-orthogonal projection. Um, it's going to produce and reproduce holomorphic functions. And there's a way to relate this auxiliary operator to the main operator we want to study, which is either the Bergman or Zago projection. And I'll show on the following slide how that's done. And the upshot of this is that this um, operator has a more or less explicit kernel that can be estimated, which was our original problem because we couldn't estimate the Bergman or Zagel kernel. And then harmonic, uh, methods in harmonic analysis, such as Schur's lemma or the T of one theorem, can be used to control uh, the auxiliary operator, depending if you're dealing with the Bergman or Zago case. And I'll mention that um, the minimal smoothness case where D has C2 boundary is more difficult and there, Lanzani and Stein actually have to pass to a family of operators in the parameter epsilon, uh, T epsilon. Um, and the way I'm going to explain things the rest of the talk, uh, it will go through if the domain has slightly more regularity. So, for example, C3 smoothness for the Zega projection, C4 smoothness for the Bergman projection. If you wanted to get down to C2, which we actually do in the case of the Zega projection, um, I initially thought we couldn't for the Bergman uh, projection, but now Zhang Hui's talk is making me think that maybe it can be done. Um, so we're going to sort of deal with the simpler case in, in this talk, but sort of the same similar ideas can be applied in the minimal smoothness case. Um, and so the idea with this trick is that because the operator T is a non-orthogonal projection, you can obtain the following operator identities in L2, and um, they're as follows, TB equals B and BT equals T. And um, you can do some straightforward manipulation. You can take adjoints of this uh, first equation and subtract it over, do some manipulation, and you arrive at this equation. So I get uh, the Bergman projection times the identity minus T star minus T equals T. And so this T star minus T uh, term here is sort of measuring how far away this non-orthogonal projection is from being an orthogonal projection or being self-adjoint. Um, and so then what's the idea here? Um, the idea is that you, you, if you want to prove LP boundedness of the Bergman projection D, you want to show that the right-hand side is bounded on LP, so show that uh, T is bound in LP using, for example, something like Schur's lemma, or in the case of the uh, Zago projection, when you have to deal with uh, more singular integral theory, the P of one theorem. And then you show that this operator, the identity minus T star minus T, is invertible on LP. 
and that's using some harmonic analysis and functional analysis. Uh, and then the idea is that you invert this operator and conclude that the original operator B extends to a bounded mapping on LP. And what we were uh, originally wondering is if this trick can be used for weights. Um, and the answer is yes. And so I'll state our following theorems. Um, these were, these appeared in a paper which was recently uh, accepted in advances in math. And the, the first theorem is that if uh, D is strongly pseudo-convex with C2 boundaries, so the minimal smooth in this case, then for P between one and infinity and sigma and AP, the Zago projection extends to a bounded operator on LP sigma. So again, you would have to define your AP class on the boundary using some sort of quasi metric. I won't get into the exact details, but this is the flavor of the result that for sigma and AP, you get boundedness on LP sigma. If you bump up the regularity a little bit, you can actually uh, say things which are sharper. So if E is strongly pseudo-convex and has C3 boundary, then uh, I can say that this sort of error operator C star minus C is compact on the weighted space. And moreover, this operator, the identity minus C star minus C is invertible on the weighted space. And not only does the Zega projection extend to a bounded operator, but I can write it this way um, using the inversion of this operator. So I have um, a formula for the extension that relates it to this um, Cauchy type operator C. And then we can do the same thing in the case of the, the Bergman projection um, with C4 boundary. And there, uh, again, we're using the operator T instead of the operator C, but we get the, the same result that T star minus T is compact, this operator is invertible, and you get this extension. And so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna talk about the Bergman case for clarity. I don't have time to address both, but they're somehow similar in many ways. Um, and so the idea is that for a domain with near minimal smoothness, we can prove that the Bergman uh, projection is bounded on weighted LP if uh, sigma belongs to an appropriate generalization of the BP class. And you might ask, what's the generalization? Well, um, you have to have a, a quasi metric to define uh, the weight class uh, because then you can define it the same way Beckley did when you look at a collection of balls that meet uh, the boundary. And so this has to reflect the geometry of the domain somehow. And this quasi metric goes back to the work of McNeil, who um, sort of studied uh, obtaining estimates on the Bergman kernel for these various uh, types of domains by using a, a scaling approach with polydisks. So you can define a quasi-metric using these polydisks that fit in level sets of the defining function, and that gives you a quasi-metric to work with. And prove that the auxiliary operator is bounded. So that would be um, this here, which is the right-hand side of the equation before I invert. Um, we use a modified version of calderon zygmunt theory, which is similar to, to what Beckley does, as opposed to Schur's lemma. So Schur's lemma is good um, for positive operators with radial weights, but it's bad for the general weighted case. And then we have to invert this other operator. Um, and that's done sort of in two steps. First, we show that T star minus T is compact on weighted LP. And then you also need to know that uh, one is not in the spectrum. So you need to know that one cannot be an eigenvalue T star minus T on the weighted LP space. And then the result just follows from the spectral theorem. And let me say in broad strokes, the proof of compactness uses some kernel estimates, um, a modified version of Schur's lemma with factorization of weights and some functional analysis. And the point is that for these auxiliary operators, we can actually get a handle on the curve. So we can estimate it. And the proof that one is not an eigenvalue uh, relies on kernel estimates that implies the operator T star minus T is smoothing in the sense that it improves LP spaces. So in the time I have left, let me kind of outline those approaches briefly. Um, so for proving the boundedness of T, the way this auxiliary operator is actually constructed 
is it's constructed as a sum. So this first piece T1 has an explicit kernel and that's constructed uh, using cauchy Plantapie theory. And the second uh, term here is a correction term that's needed uh, to make the operator uh, produce holomorphic functions. And that doesn't have an explicit kernel. It's obtained by solving a D-bar problem, but we do know that its kernel is bounded. And in fact, that's a, sort of enough for what we need. So it suffices to prove the weighted boundedness of the first piece T1. And the way we do that is to find a comparison operator gamma. Um, for those of you who have read Lenzani and Stein's work, this is a similar object that appears there. This is integration against this positive kernel, the modulus of G of WC to the N plus one power. And that function is related to the Levy polynomial of the defining function, or basically as a Levy polynomial um, with some uh, correction. And you get this pointwise domination of T1 by this positive gamma operator. Uh, but rather than applying a Schur's test to gamma, which is what Lenzani and Stein do, we can actually obtain some modified size to smoothest estimates for its kernel uh, because uh, the Levy polynomial is nicely related to our quasi-metric. And then you can proceed in a similar way to Beckele uh, to prove the weighted regularity on LP of this operator. Improving compactness of T star minus T, that was sort of the, uh, the next step of the proof. Um, the big idea here is that uh, T star minus T, uh, there's some cancellation of singularities that occurs. Um, this error is going to be less singular on the boundary diagonal than the originally than the original operator T was. Um, and in fact, in the case where the domain is the unit ball, you can compute that actually T equals B and T star minus T equals zero. So that's an extreme example, but for a general strongly pseudoconvex domains with say um, C4 smoothness, uh, you get you, you do get sufficient cancellation uh, for what we need. And this lemma is important in proving the compactness of the operator. And if you look at it, it's kind of a, uh, a vanishing version uh, of Schur's test because it involves in integration of, um, you can think of the weight as the test function here against this positive kernel, that's the kernel of the, of the uh, error operator, uh, but it's sort of a, a vanishing one because I'm integrating over this uh, small ball, uh, VZ delta in the appropriate quasi-metric, and I get this decay term out front that decays as um, delta goes to zero and as the distance from Z to the boundary goes to zero. Um, and that turns out to be exactly what we need to, comp to conclude that the operator T star minus T is compact, the sort of vanishing Schur's lemma. And so if you recall, I said the next part was proving that um, one can't be an eigenvalue of T star minus T on, uh, L, on weighted LP. Uh, we know it can't be on L2 just because this is anti-self adjoint, so it has purely imaginary uh, spectrum. Uh, but if I had an uh, eigenvalue one with associated eigenvector F on the weighted space, um, I can sort of relate that to unweighted spaces. I can uh, just use Holder's inequality to show that such an F is an L1. And then it's actually enough to show that this um, error operator T star minus T maps LP to LP plus epsilon for all P greater than or equal to one and some fixed epsilon greater than zero. And then what we get is that if F were such an eigenvector on the weighted space, well, with eigenvalue one, the equation is T star minus T applied to F equals F. So if F is originally in L1, but then T star minus T has a smoothing property for all P greater than or equal to one. So actually F then has to be in L1 plus epsilon, L1 plus two epsilon, and you see it has to be in all LP if you iterate that argument. So in fact, it must belong to L2 and that's a contradiction. So one cannot be an eigenvalue of T star minus T on the weighted space. And to prove that you get this LP improvement, you just need to use uh, this integrability property of its kernel. 
that you that the kernel is actually slightly better than integral. There exists an epsilon greater than zero, so that if I take the modulus kernel to the one plus epsilon power, that's uniformly integrable in z and w. And then you can invert this operator, and uh, that's just following from the spectral theorem. And so my time is basically up, but I'll just say we can prove similar theorems when sigma is in AP and the Zega projection. Uh, there's a slightly different auxiliary um, operator. Uh, of course, now the integration takes place on the boundary rather than the interior of the domain. So C is a, is a Cauchy type operator. And in this case, we obtain the result for the minimal smoothness case, which is C2. And it, it is um, important that the AP weights satisfy a reverse holder inequality, which does not uh, hold for BP weights. And uh, hearing Zheng Hui's talk makes me think that actually the result could be obtained for the Bergman projection as well, though we, we didn't do that um, in our work. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Um, and that's all I have.